All right. Mm, hang on. Are we live? I'll say something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's working. Perfect. So welcome everyone to this uh, very much delayed uh, tech session on Twitch. Uh, today we're going to talk a lot about the technology and go pretty deep into uh, visualizing a little bit the different uh, debug modes we have to, um, to get a better understanding on the rendering. I'm going to talk a little bit about the physics and then maybe if we have time we can uh, do a little uh, on the audio as well, depending on what you want to see. So if you just, uh, if you have comments, Emil is in the chat to, uh, we'll keep an, an eye on the chat and I'll, I'll uh, show a little bit from the game at the same time. All right, so let's start off with the rendering. I'm gonna fire up, uh, let's do, um, this one I think is good. So as you know, uh, Teardown uses ray tracing for rendering. That is, um, it's a lot of games doing that nowadays, but Teardown does not rely on RTX for that. I have my own uh, software implementation uh, or software. It, it does run on the GPUs, I guess it's a hardware implementation, but um, it's implemented entirely in a regular GLSL shader. And uh, let's talk first a little bit about the scene and, and how it works and we can get more into details later. So um, I'm gonna show you the different render passes that is, that's done. And we'll start with the depth pass. Uh, a lot of games do a depth pass before rendering anything else because it uh, uh, has a lot of advantages because you can use that to cull stuff later. Uh, Teradon uses a G buffer approach. So I actually render depth and other things such as albedo and normal at the same time. Uh, all objects are only drawn once in Teradon. So I just draw all the object, objects once uh, to a G buffer. Uh, because drawing the scene is actually very, very time consuming. If we bring up the profiler here and look at this view, I'm gonna make it the actual rendering. We can see my timers here that the total drawing time for this particular frame is 14 milliseconds and of which the G buffer is five, 0.23 something. Uh, so it's uh, more than a third of the frame is just spent putting all the objects in the G buffer with absolutely no lighting, no post processing, no uh, nothing, nothing else. So the output from that G buffer pass is the depth, color, and normal. And um, and we really just want to withdraw that once because if we had to do it all one more time, that, that would be uh, another five milliseconds. Um, so there was a depth and then another component of the G buffer, which is drawn at the same time, but the result goes into uh, a separate buffer is the color buffer or the albedo buffer. So this is what the pure colors of the scene look like with no lighting. It's just, um, and, and as you can see, it's rendered with no textures or anything. Uh, the individual voxels in Teardown are uh, always single colored. Uh, if you look at the ground here, you can see that it's uh, it looks textured, especially from a distance. And it is, it is actually a texture, but it maps one pixel in that texture uh, maps a one to one with the voxels. So a voxel always has just one color. 
but it could actually technically have slightly different colors on each side because of this uh, projection of the texturing. So anyway, uh, that was the color, and then we have the normal as the last component of the G-buffer. There's actually one more component of the G-buffer we can talk about later. Um, normals are drawn because they are needed for lighting, and it's also pretty standard. So everything in green here is pointing upwards, everything in blue is pointing that way, uh, and red is pointing this way. Um, and because objects can have different uh, rotations, you can also see it's, it's not, uh, we still need full normals because these are in world space, so uh, we need to have a, a full normal back and point in any direction, even though the voxels only have six directions. Uh, and then I do, when the G-buffer is in place, actually let's talk about the last thing in the G-buffer, which is also which is a velocity buffer, which basically records the motion of each pixel on the screen. Uh, and that motion is very important, not just for motion blur, which is the uh, maybe most obvious usage for that, uh, but even more importantly, uh, it's used for the temporal anti-aliasing, which someone wrote in the chat right now. That's nice. Uh, so yes, um, Teradon uses temporal anti-aliasing. As you can see, that's why the screen is flickering, because temporal anti-aliasing, if you don't know what it is, is a way to do anti-aliasing by accumulating frames over time. And it's uh, pretty standard nowadays, I think, in most engines. It's uh, way cheaper than the previous uh, anti-aliasing techniques that were use, used and in many cases I would say the result is actually also better but it can be it can result in flickering in sometimes and I I'm doing a couple of things in the engine to avoid flickering but I don't think we should go into those uh, tiny details here maybe I'll write that on the on the blog later um, so there's also a separate buffer. I do a pass on the normals before lighting, which is smoothing them out a little bit. It's probably hard to see in this view, but if we take a look in uh, the actual rendering, let's see if we find an angle here. Maybe when you played the game, you also seen it. Here, I think we can see it. Uh, since the normals in the game are very are very sharp edges, I do a, a pass, just a post-processing pass on the normal buffer where I smooth out the normals a little bit based on a heuristic uh, to get this. You can see there is a, a, a brighter line here at the edge, which wouldn't be there other, otherwise. That's because I kind of take the, um, the sharpness off the edge a little bit and smooth out a couple of pixels. And that makes quite a big difference for how the the voxels are perceived. Like here you can see very clearly that there is this very subtle brightness on the on the edges in some cases that makes them look a little rounder. And that's just uh, this processing of the normal buffer that, that does that. So there's no geometry involved for that. And I think maybe be before we move on to the lighting, or, or do we have something from the chat? Maybe we should stop here and, and take <clears throat> questions. If... There's a million questions already. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see if I can find some that are uh, related to the tech. Uh, could we have weight-based objects? For example, stone is heavy, so higher impact damage on landing. Would this be possible? Yeah, let, let's stick to questions about what I talked about. Uh, okay. Is there any, any questions on, on... Does it use sparse voxel octree ray tracing or does it use plain BVH ray tracing? Uh, it's not... It is an octree, so I, I guess yes, a little bit. But, but let, let's move on. I, I think that will be answered in, in what I would was talking about next. 
So let's uh, show some debug rendering here. So this is what the objects look like that are drawn to the screen. Uh, each yellow box here is a voxel shape and it's oriented exactly the way it appears on the screen here. So it's, it's aligned with the voxels themselves. And as you can see, they are when modeling something for this game, we try to make, maybe it's a little hard to see here with all the lines, but <laughs> let's take this tree here, for instance. It has one uh, object for the leaves up here, and there is one object for the trunk. And that is because we don't, we don't want more uh, volume than was absolutely necessary to enclose the object. It does have to be a box just because that's I use 3D textures to store this. Um, so in many cases we have to split up objects in multiple shapes uh, to not waste too much memory. But it's not only memory because I'll, I'll, I'll show you soon how this is traced out during the gbuffer pass, how we get the pixels on the screen because there are no triangles in this game, everything is <clears throat> is rendered directly from volume data. So if we switch over to, let's see if I can do this. Um, here, where I can sketch a little bit. So let's assume we have the eye here, uh, and we have our scene with different shapes. I'm going to do this in 2D, but you can extrapolate that to 3D. Oh, the disappointment. <laughs> uh, wait for the next generation mobile devices here for the 3D version. So um, this is our frustrum here. So obviously the first thing that happens if, if an object is totally outside the frustrum, it gets discarded immediately and not drawn at all. And then for the rest of the objects, these objects all, these are the yellow boxes I just showed you. They are all their own uh, voxel volumes consisting of from, I don't know, what would be a typical size, maybe 50 by 50 by 50 up to 100. It could be anything up to a million or to three million voxels maybe in, in the biggest ones. Um, and the way they're rendered, they are rendered with uh, the bounding box. The, these yellow boxes you saw, that's what's actually get drawn or fed to the rasterizer during the gbuffer pass. So translating this to 2D, we would draw this box here. Let's make it another color so we can see. So this is what gets drawn. I actually draw the back face of each box. So in this case, we would draw these two. And as that gets rasterized to the screen, uh, when drawing, say, this line here, um, we can trace out, actually, let's, uh, let's follow this ray here going out from the eye, if we're rasterizing, rasterizing the pixel that's ending up here on the near plane. Um, and we have an object that looks maybe like this. Let's see, we have some voxels here. Okay. And the first thing we, we find out is the intersection point of this ray and the bounding box itself. And that point we can just compute mathematically to be, say it's here. Uh, so that's where we start the trace or the ray marching through the voxel volume. So we start with this voxel here and see that it is empty. And that means we're gonna have to keep going. Uh, and the way we keep going is we use 
a uh, voxel marching algorithm called Amanatides and Wu. It's a paper by Amanatides and Wu. Uh, maybe you recognize the names. Um, and that works. So you follow the, the edges of the voxels. So in this case, if we zoom in a little bit more, this was the first one. Keep going in that direction is going to hit this edge uh, over here. And after hitting that edge, we know that we also gonna have to check the neighboring voxel on the to the right here. Uh, and since that's also empty, we keep going, stepping through. And then we know the next intersection point is on this edge here. Uh, and then we, we keep going like this. You can't just step equally sized steps like this because then you're gonna end up missing stuff. Uh, so you're actually gonna do this amenotides of Wu. Uh, it's also called super cover algorithm for traversing voxels. Uh, and we keep doing that until we hit something. And in this case, that means we're gonna have to check this edge and look in this one, there wasn't anything there, keep going until we cross this edge and then we switch over to this voxel and here we actually found something. And what we found, the first voxel we enter where there is data is gonna determine the pixel color for, uh, for this thing here. So this is gonna be a green pixel in that case. And what's actually stored in, in each voxel cell is just one byte of data. So this might be an eight, this might be 110, um, and, uh, and so on. So there are no RGB values, there are no like, reflectivity and stuff like that. All these are just uh, index lookups into a palette that stores uh, up to 255 different materials. Uh, and since we have multiple of these volumes, uh, each one of those can have their own palette. So that's why you see more than 255 colors in the game, because every object can have 255 unique colors and materials. So back to the question on the oak tree. This is a very simplified uh, explanation on how it works. In reality, I also do this hierarchically. You can see this as a 3D texture, each of these boxes. Uh, and I'm just using the standard MIP mapping feature of texture mapping to walk up and down that. Like it, it's, it's basically an oak tree. Uh, but I only use the two first MIP levels. So I start doing this traversal in the in the second MIP, and then if I find a hit, I switch over to the the, uh, the first one, and then if I find something there, I, I finally go to the base level and, and check there. And then there is a pretty complex algorithm to uh, for knowing when to switch to a particular MIP level, because it's not always the most obvious one, you have to profile which is which is the fastest to avoid recomputing a lot of these uh, traversal constants and keeping the memory uh, small to fit the caches in the shader and all that stuff. Um, was that very clear? <laughs> Extremely. Good. Uh, are there any questions on this part? Actually, I, I ask no, no, not anything particular. I ask people to hold on to the question mm -hmm. for um, for like assigned question time because it's just streaming by. Right. So uh, just to if someone missed the context of this, this is just for getting uh, the G buffer on the screen, the color of the objects, uh, the normals and the depth. So this is not uh, exactly what, what's happening for, for lighting. That comes later. 
Uh, how do you transform the ray into the voxel space of an object? That's just a matrix multiplication. So it's, um, I mean, you know the, the transform of each of these and you know the transform of the camera. So you just make that conversion. How do you handle intersecting objects and the resulting depth ordering problems? That's actually a really good question uh, that I spent a lot of time on because since, as I said before, I'm only rendering the back face here. Technically in the shader, I know that the depth is not going to be it's, it's, it's going to be somewhere in this box, but there's no way to express in the shader uh, two bounds in between a depth value can be, and that can confuse the uh, the hardware, the C buffering hardware a little bit. Um, so I, I had have to do uh, certain very specific techniques to draw them in multiple passes and uh, record uh, like an offline depth buffer that I can compare against um, in multiple passes for all this to work. I don't, I don't know if that was the answer to the question, but it, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, I know the depth once I've done the trace. The problem is that I don't know, say I draw this object here first and another part of the GPU, because all, all of these are kind of drawn in parallel because the GPU it's just doing a lot of parallel stuff so this object right here can actually be drawn uh, simultaneously as this object uh, and we don't know if parts of this object is going to be visible until we've rasterized this one traditionally in, in C buffer techniques the uh, the rasterizer can figure that out because it knows uh, what parts will be covered and not unless you discard the pixels in the shader. But in this case, we don't know that because not until we've traversed the whole voxel volume, we know if, if it's going to be a hole where you can see all the way through this object and actually see something that is behind here. So depth is a uh, tricky to get right. And that is from a performance perspective only. I think we should move on to lighting. Um, or is it, did you see some other question, Emil, that we should answer right away? I think you can continue. Yeah. So we switch back to this one and <clears throat> so now we have the G uh, uh, one mm. question yes. that pops up. Do you store each object in a separate 3D texture or are they all packed in a single 3D atlas? They're all in their <clears throat> own 3D texture. So there are I don't know how many shapes are there in this level. It's 2091. So there are more than 2,000 3D textures in this scene. Uh, but it works surprisingly well, I would say. I didn't expect that to work when we started, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a problem with it. Um, so now that we have the G buffer, we are going to work on the lighting. This is the raw output of the first of the diffuse part of the lighting and it includes both the lighting from the sky dome and the light sources uh, i wish i had a way to separate them here but i don't actually have that in this debug view <clears throat> but if we go over here where there aren't any light sources this the, so here you can see more just the sky dome lightning lighting. Um, and I think this is probably the key to why lighting looks pretty realistic in teardown. 
um, because I use this Skydome lighting for, it's also called, amb it, it's like a mix between ambient occlusion and Skydome lighting. Uh, what it does is to send a race for every pixel. For this pixel right here, it's gonna send a number of random rays out in, in, in different directions and see if they hit uh, the sky, basically. Uh, that's uh, so it is what we call real ambient occlusion and not the fake screen space ambient occlusion that you can see in a lot of games uh, which doesn't look very good uh, the rays I use for amb ambient occlusion and this lighting pass are Let's see if I remember. I think, I think there's 32 meters, so they're actually pretty long. So that's also why you see it gets <clears throat> much darker under the trees here, and also indoors. That relies entirely. Now we actually let's <laughs> fix the lights here. It actually gets pretty dark. Uh, where is that light? magic yeah I don't know uh, even in pretty large rooms it gets pretty dark when you get inside like this which is a good sign because if the <clears throat> if these ambient occlusion rays were only like a couple of meters this would be full daylight in here and you can see that in a couple of places in the game if we go into this lit that's a bit larger maybe we're gonna start seeing some effects of that Um, <clears throat> mm, <clears throat> hard to say, but I think the most noticeable place in the game is this very large, <coughs> excuse me, a warehouse on the Hollow Rock Island map. There we can definitely see some some that it, it's much brighter than it actually should be in there, uh, because the room is just bigger than the maximum distance of these light rays that I use for checking. One question: How mm -hmm. many rays do you send out per per pixel? I think it's two. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I think, let's see, if I turn down, if I remember correctly, this might be wrong, but I think if I set the render scale, no, sorry, not the render scale, um, the render quality to low, I think I just do one. And, and you would see that by looking for more noise. The more rays you do per pixel, the less noise. And I think it does look a little more noisy now, right? It's probably hard to see on the stream. But... Um... So the way we send out these rays, I mean, the, the technique is super simple. For getting lighting that looks like this, that is super smooth and, uh, and and generally looks pretty good. Just sending out two rays in random directions and record, uh, add some light if you if you hit the sky, is um, is actually a really simple way of, of doing it. But it it matters a lot how you send out those rays, especially if you only send out uh, a very small number of rays. And the way I do that is using uh, blue noise. Uh, which you may see, if you look at the characteristics of the noise, I don't know if this comes through in the stream at all, uh, but the noise has this very high frequent look. It doesn't really look like a typical uh, random noise. It is random, but it's random in a very specific way where it's, it's only the high frequencies that comes through. 
Uh, and that means it's going to be much easier for us to smear out this noisy image into something um, that blends better together. So that, that's a really, really important part of this, is to use the right kind of noise and use it in the right way. Because not only these two rays we send out per pixel, we don't want to send one ray this way and have the other ray go like almost the same way because that would be a huge waste. We want them to be very uh, separate, but we don't want to sample the same direction every frame because we want to cover the whole uh, hemisphere for, uh, for that pixel. So we have to make sure uh, to cast them uh, as far away from the previous rays as possible and, and cover and still cover the whole dome, which is super, super complicated if you do this uh, in 3D and consider <clears throat> all three dimensions and also uh, time in that because we don't want to be, for every frame, they also have to be pretty different. Um, so that's the most important light pass. And when that is done, and I'm, I'm gonna, talk a little bit later on how that's done, uh, more specifically how, how this ray tracing is done uh, on the GPU. Uh, I do a little bit of denoising on that. Um, it, it looks very flickery here, but that's actually not just the noise itself. It's also because of this temporal anti-aliasing. Since, since the geometry here is so detailed. Uh, it's also uh, quite annoying that you get so much noise from just the temporal anti-aliasing jitter. Uh, but I have some techniques in to uh, <laughs> fix that up later in the pipeline. But since this is a raw image from the lighting itself, uh, it comes through uh, very visibly here. But if we look at the noise here, you can see, it, see it's still <clears throat> it's still very visibly noisy, even though it has uh, been going through a pass of denoising. Uh, and the reason it looks better in the final game <clears throat> is because of the, uh, the temporal anti-aliasing, which tends to eat up a lot of noise when you uh, smooth this out over time. So when we have that, <clears throat> um, we add the colors back in that we have in the G-buffer already. I don't know why, <laughs> why it's so dark. I must have, um, <clears throat> it, there must be a problem with the scaling here because it shouldn't be this dark. Um, <clears throat> but that's pretty much it for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for the diffuse lighting. Um, all the magic happens in this pass, and then there is some denoising and just mixing it with the diffuse colors. And then the second part, important part of the lighting, is the reflections, which is done very much the same way, <clears throat> just casting I, rays. I, Dennis, I'll sneak mm. in a couple of questions. Yes. Um, uh, which I think is relevant to the ray, uh, ray tracing. Did you consider updating the depth buffer from the shader to resolve occlusion using shader depth output? It does prevent early set culling, but would be very simple. Uh, <clears throat> say that one more time. <laughs> <coughs> I'll send it to you in the Discord so you can read and consider it. Um... I can manage. There you go. It does sound interesting. Let me see. Did you consider updating the depth buffer from the shader to resolve occlusion shader depth output? Uh, that is not possible. That's what I want to do. But at least in OpenGL, I didn't find a way to do that. I, th I think um, <clears throat> I actually had contact with someone at NVIDIA about this and they suggested a method um, that I haven't tried yet. So there might be, it, it's technically a very good idea. I just didn't find a way to implement that yet. But 
uh, send me a message on Twitter if you know exactly how to do this, uh, and I would be very interested. And here's another one. <clears throat> In, uh, yeah, I sent it to you in text. All right. And just as a follow up on the previous one, the reason it's not so easy as it sounds is because, as I said before, a lot of these objects and draw calls are going to happen simultaneously on the GPU. Uh, so, so you can't really write to the depth buffer while all the others are reading from it because that would cause, but, but maybe it can be updated in a certain way to still make it possible. I'm, I'm not sure if using atomics or, or something like that. Uh, yes, was, uh, let's see, what was the other one? What I about, can read it for you if you like to. What about doing direct ray tracing like you currently do in voxel space and indirect lighting in screen space like you used to? <clears throat> um, yeah, I, the screen space lighting I was experimenting with early. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to use that when when I have the option to do it in voxel space because it, there's there are just advantages with the voxel space it's so much faster and the results are so much better. Uh, the screen space ray tracing had a lot of problems and it also required the scene to be rendered multiple times and uh, yeah no uh, it, it wouldn't really work. So was there anything else before we move on? No, you're free to proceed. All right. So reflections. <clears throat> now, uh, since we have a method to just throw uh, shoot rays, that's what we're also using for reflections. Um, and this is just showing the pure reflections. The reason it's black here at the bottom is that I don't render reflections if if there is no, uh, if they're not going to contribute to the pixel value at all, I don't draw them. So that's why they appear black to save some time. <clears throat> and um, ray, the, the rays here are also in, in voxel space, but the color are fetched from screen space. So let's see if we can find an example of where that uh, is visible. I don't know if we can... And it's actually <clears throat> a good demonstration on, on how unimportant the color of the reflection is. Uh, since I don't have access to the color information, um, most of the reflections are just going to be black, which is then not really reflections. Technically, it's more like an, a specular occlusion. But when you, um, in this case, you would see the truck actually here because it is visible in screen space, but it's still like very, the color contribution compared to the reflection of the sky, which is <laughs> not visible here, but it, it is uh, visible in the reflection, is very, very small. So no matter what the color of the reflection is, it's still just going to look almost black in most cases, unless it's something like an emissive uh, um, material or a light source. So if we show the final image here, you're going to see that the, the contribution here is very, very small, but I think it's also very important. Like you can see here, the dark areas around uh, the underside of the truck here, they're not really a shadow, especially not this part here. They are um, the effect of specular occlusion. So I think specular occlusion is very, very important for a realistic um, look of the image. And it's also one of the, the things I, 
I miss in, in a lot of renders, like people don't consider it uh, as important as say direct shadows from light sources or other types of, of shadows. But I, I think specular occlusion is, is, is very, very important for to get these contact um, darkenings. It's not, it is not technically, or maybe it is technically a shadow, but it's it's uh, it's more related to the reflections than uh, the light coming from um, specific light sources. Um, <clears throat> and you can see another example here. And since we we use this do this with ray tracing, uh, we also do this uh, with respect to the roughness of the material. So a lot of the reflections you're going to see in the game. <clears throat> are uh, fuzzy, so the, the further you, you you go from the um, the object, the more fuzzy it's going to be like this. Um, <clears throat> so that was the reflections. Maybe we should pause here and show how that is done. Uh, if or did we have any questions on that? I, you're welcome to type your questions. Did you do any experiments with voxel cone tracing? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I don't think it's... Um, maybe it would work. It probably would. But I, I just don't see them. I'm, I'm personally much more interested in ray tracing and uh, using stochastic methods uh, to do this, the soft shadow thing instead of doing the cone tracing. Uh, so let's see, let's switch over to this one. And <clears throat> so for the lighting, let's redraw what we had before. We have the scene. Can you see that? Yes. Scene here. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple of objects. Let's make it a little more, a little simplified this time. Actually, I should zoom out. So here's our scene, and just for the sake of simplicity, say we have two objects in it. Or maybe just one. Um, this looks like this. Kind of strange voxels, these. <laughs> okay. <Patriot>. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is what the object looks like. We have some kind of bounding box here. This was the yellow boxes you saw in the scene. And then we have, the reason I, I was drawing this scene boundary is that in Teardown, the whole scene also is a 3D texture, which is, is really big. I think it's uh, close to 2000 by 2000 on the largest levels. Uh, by maybe 500 in height so it's it can be up to almost a gigabyte in in size uh, because it's only one bit per voxel so i can actually fit eight voxels in a single byte because i don't store anything in there i just want to know is there something here blocking light or not so i can do that with a single bit uh, to save a lot of memory. Um, so this is also a voxel volume. It has the same resolution as the objects, but it's not necessarily oriented the same way. So this one is always oriented in world space because it's only one. And then we have a lot of rotated objects uh, in that space, but they have uh, their own individual rotations. So what we have to do is to translate this rotation into 
this one. And the way that works, it's actually done on the CPU. It's a multi-threaded, very optimized uh, piece of code that does that every frame. It analyzes what have changed in the scene. Uh, and then I just go and, and splat all the voxels from the individual objects into the world space voxel grid. So this object would be splatted into something like this because it has to be aligned with the world axis. Um, so let's see if we can show that. So we have two versions of it. One, uh, one is the the object which is drawn to the G buffer, and then we have the sh what I call the shadow volume representation, which is a realigned and uh, converted version of that that is always axis aligned. Uh, and that is what's used. Uh, so all the lighting is happening in this space and not this one. So once the G buffer is drawn, uh, this representation is never used. Everything else is done on this um, axis aligned representation. Uh, other than that, it's, it's pretty much the exact same method as I'm using to draw the G buffer. So starting array here, say, um, uh, I just keep going through the voxel grid. I haven't drawn out all the grid cells, but they're here. They're aligned with the same here. Uh, just keep doing exactly the, the same thing, uh, checking for edge intersections and moving this one, that one, this one, and that one. And then we found a hit, and then we know this ray actually hit something. Um, and what's uh, what's nice with that is that we can also do this, uh, since it's a 3D texture, we can just draw these, uh, store these mip maps. So we have a, a two levels of mip maps uh, as an oak tree, also for the shadows. Uh, which is used a lot, as I talked about before, these 32 meter uh, rays for uh, the ambient occlusion. That's quite a lot of voxel steps, uh, stepping through 32 meters. That would be something like three, 400 steps probably. But since it's done on these MIP levels, and a lot of it is just going to be stepping through large um, amounts of air, um, and that's uh, actually relatively fast still. Uh, but I think this is this is probably the most important part in teardown ray tracing, that this ray tracing happens on this representation and not on that one. All the RTX, uh, so what RTX is trying to do, except it's not for voxels, <coughs> it has, um, uh, so a lot of triangles like this, and then all the, the different objects uh, also get a bounding box. These bounding boxes are stored in a bounding volume hierarchy, and for each ray you first traverse uh, the hierarchy and then the individual triangles to find a hit, which uh, obviously for doing that for millions and millions and millions of arrays, every frame is very, very time consuming. Whereas in teardown, when you have this big axis aligned voxel structure, uh, it, it's rel or comparatively cheap to step through this data in instead of doing all that other stuff. And another really good thing with this way of doing it is that for some rays, um, the accuracy of the ray tracing is not as important. So in many cases, um, the ambient occlusion is actually a good example where I can cheat a little bit in the ray tracing. So instead of doing this more 
time consuming uh, Amana types and Wu uh, super cover algorithm to not have any light leak through stuff. It's usually okay to just step a fixed size through the voxel grid. So instead of doing this, if you have another ray here, um, I can, this was the ray, I can just step like this, the fixed steps. So maybe instead of checking 20 different voxels, because if I, if I do the supercarbon algorithm, I would need to check maybe all these voxels to make sure not to miss something. Whereas uh, doing it more sparsely, I could technically miss something. If there was something here, I would miss it. But since it's just an ambient occlusion ray and there's lots of rays and they are randomized. So if you, if you run into a small problem like that, it's not going to be too visible and ruin the image. Uh, but for the G buffer, that wouldn't be an option because you don't want to have random holes in your objects. Uh, so that's how the ray tracing works. <laughs> Any questions? It's. I think it's all obvious. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Super Good. clear. Please, if you have any questions, go ahead. Uh... Wouldn't you be able to keep a smaller world texture centered around the player? It's actually an interesting idea, but you, any, any pixel you see on the screen needs to have this, because if you just remove shadows, it's going to be very visible, because it's going to receive direct sunlight and stuff like that, even though it's hidden in a crease somewhere. So it, it looks really, really bad when you don't have this covered. Uh, and maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't mention it and maybe it was obvious, but this large texture is of course the reason uh, levels are relatively small and we have a, a size limitation on the levels. If it weren't for this, uh, levels could be much, much larger in Teardown. This is where all the memory <laughs> is, is consumed for, for the game. Do you always end up at MIP zero, even for ambient occlusion, where the cone is wider? It's a good question, actually. I, it depends on which pass. For ambient occlusion, I think that is the case, but I would need to check. But for, for reflections, I definitely do that. Reflection rays typically deviate a lot if you have rough materials. So if, if you have, um, if you have a reflection like this, incoming light here, and then it out goes, and the ray like that. Uh, for rough materials, it's typically you you throw random rays around the perfect reflection. And the further you go, um, what I think uh, you meant in the comment in the chat here was to maybe you shouldn't check uh, the fine detail in the voxel uh, texture at all. Maybe you should just uh, stop at mid level one or two. And that's exactly what I'm doing for reflections when, when they've traveled a certain distance. So I start at a fine detail voxel grid like that and then when I've been traversing this for maybe 10 voxels or something like that I go over to the first MIP level and continue there 
Uh, and then when it's been doing some of that, I switch over to the even bigger ones. And then if I, if I find something here, if this is a hit, uh, in some cases I just return like this probably hit something, even though I, I should, I should technically go down the MIP chain and check if it was actually a hit or if it was something else. But for, for these very rough reflections, uh, it typically doesn't matter very much. And I can show that in the game actually, because that's a difference between low and high settings, uh, which is fairly visible. Let's see if we can find a good spot. I think this should be a good spot for it. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> um, let's try this one should be. Yeah, on water you can, since water don't have very rough reflections, it gets much more visible when, when you're near water. So let's see here. If you look at this here, and we switch back to high, you can see it gets much thicker when we go to low. And that's because we're just looking at the, the first level of the, um, uh, of the MIP map. And if I move back even further, now it's a little hard to see because the surface is moving, but um, but as I move even further away, it's uh, gonna be even bigger. Like now you can see the reflection of the truck is actually much bigger than the truck itself. But when I move closer, it actually gets smaller. So let's see, did we have any other questions? Did you? No, I think you're fine. Yeah. <clears throat> so what should we move on to now? Should we talk about physics or do you want more rendering? First one to, to, to say, yeah, rendering. Rendering. One boat. Physics, 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 physics rendering. <laughs> okay. Um, math. I think physics is. Yeah, let's. Looks let's like it's winning out. See. <clears throat> I don't know. Physics is a little harder to talk about because it's not so visible, and I don't have the same amount of visualization for the physics. I actually have a contact point visualization, but I don't think it's compiled in, right? Maybe I even removed it. Um, so I do have one visualization for the physics, which is the bodies. So this is the rigid bodies of the scene. Anything that is a yellow box now is a a dynamic body that you can move around. And you can see when I break something, uh, the orientation of this box, uh, it's related to the inertia tensor. The inertia tensor is how resistant the uh, object is to rotate in certain directions. Um, and I visualize that with this box. And that is, of course, recomputed every time you uh, smash something. And just in general, I think physics has been much easier with voxels than with polygons, because physics really can take advantage of things being volumetric uh, in a way that's, that's pretty hard with uh, with polygons when it comes to that. So taking this as an example, when destroying something, there's always material on the inside and the 
the algorithm for computing the inertia tensor for a voxel object is is almost trivial. You just sum up all the voxels and you know if the voxels have different materials <clears throat> all that gets summed in in the same loop and, and you get a very accurate uh, behavior of and center of mass and all that is just recomputed from the voxels and their materials uh, so all, all of that it, there is no hand tweaking so to speak for for any of those things which is what you typically have a lot of in uh, when you make polygon based physics uh, because since you only have the the surface representation you don't know uh, how how it behaves if it's hollow or if it's solid and stuff like that whereas in voxels that just works uh, physics in teardown is a fairly regular rigid body simulation there is really not that much to say about the solver it does have a few things uh, that it does very differently from, from other stuff and one i'm not sure how technical i should get here if we have any physics coders <laughs> watching <clears throat> but one uh, very common performance bottleneck in physics is when you have all these contact points, this as when, when you do collision detection, detect something is close enough to generate a contact point, all those contact points get sent to solver that makes sure they just don't uh, just stop the motion uh, so they can't move towards each other. And if they already started moving inside each other, you push them up and stuff like that. So one common thing uh, that takes a lot of uh, uh, it put a lot of effort in that in physics engine is to manage these contact points and pairs because you you typically need to track these contact points over time to make the simulation stable uh, and that has to do with something called warm starting or friction correlation uh, and if you haven't done your own physics engine you probably wouldn't know what that is or why it's important but in order to make something actually not uh, if you have a pile of rubble and you want that to actually fall asleep uh, and not just lay on the ground jittering forever uh, that's actually quite important and for teardown and for the solver i'm using here uh, i actually don't have any uh, such uh, pair management there's no uh, state um, in <laughs> uh, collisions or what's between two objects There's the only state that carries over to the next frame is in the bodies themselves which i think is a novel way to do a physics solver but i'm not sure that maybe someone uh, did that before and that has some uh, consequences that you can see in the game <clears throat> typically things are really stable if you stack them like this it can handle huge uh, uh, number of objects because you don't have to do this correlation it gets really fast and also the voxel collision detection generates an absurd a number of contact points so uh, it <clears throat> it would be very very tricky to track all those and since everything supports full concave collision detection typically collision detection only works for convex objects whereas when you do it like this with uh, voxel collision detection uh, you, they can have ab absolutely any shape uh, they want and that also has would have consequences if i were to do traditional pair management because that usually uh, relies on uh, a convex intersection area bit, uh, between the objects. So anyway, uh, the where this goes wrong in the game, I'm gonna see if I can <coughs> visualize that. Some of you might already have seen that. Uh, if I try, Let's see if we can. Um, 
<laughs> see if I can do this. Um, when objects typically have pretty a hard time coming to rest <clears throat> when they are moving slowly or when they are on another uh, larger rigid body that is not completely still. That was probably something else. <laughs> uh, maybe if I'm standing here, yeah, you can see it kind of crawls a little bit. And that is an effect from this lack of pair management. It's usually fine for stacking things on something that doesn't move, but that can be a problem on ships, for instance. You can see it. It's also a problem on, on these little beach huts or these timeshare cabins. Let's switch the... I think the sandbox version still has the outermost cabin intact. <clears throat> Someone destroyed it. Someone destroyed it. I wonder who that was. I... Criminals. <laughs> For that destruction to work the way we want it, we actually made the entire outermost cabin a dynamic rigid body. So if I re uh, enable the bounce and hit this, or, or maybe I'm not remembering that correctly. Yes, it is. So if I hit it, you're going to see it turns green and then it falls asleep again and goes to blue. So now if I go inside and just stand here, standing on something means that you wake up the body and try to stack things in this particular building. It's not going to be as stable as it typically is when stacking it on static ground and now it seems to work for some reason <laughs> you can you can see a lot of artifacts in this cabin for that reason but i can't really trigger it now for some reason anyway i think the most unique as, as i said the uh, there's not, not so many things that are special about the physics, other than that there is a lot of it and you can actually destroy stuff. But <clears throat> the only part of the, the physics pipeline that is special is the collision detection. And we can maybe do a similar thing where I try to explain it by drawing it out. Move over to this one and okay. Yeah, it's, it's not only doing the rendering and physics engine, he is also our concept artist. <laughs> <laughs> Connectivity calculation. Looks like a flood fill type approach. That is entirely correct. It's just a flood fill. <laughs> okay, so for collision detection, um, we have voxel objects like this. Um, let's make another one here. I'm gonna try and make them approximately the same size, but that didn't really <laughs> turn out well. Maybe I can rescale it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so we have two. Why didn't that work? Technology. Yeah. No? Why? Hmm. 
You have to draw it. You have to draw it. Ah, so rotation doesn't work when it's scaled. Could that be the case? No. Then I don't know. Okay, so let's. Uh, I wanted to show the rotation here, but. Oh, it's the other handle. Got it. <laughs> of course. <clears throat> so, um, let's fill this in with something. So, make. And the voxels here, even though they are visualized as cubes, in physics, everything is spheres. I don't know if you noticed. How many noticed that physics, that voxels are just spheres in the physics? <laughs> I, I did. You did. The easiest way to see that is for very small objects, they tend to roll the way they, they shouldn't. Not even after 20 hours. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's good. Okay, so in the physics, the um the voxel objects looks like this so let's make a voxel object here and as you might understand the real problem with having spheres if when an object looks like this and ends up on on the ground uh, or like this and starts rolling so i i have a, a something that detects uh, one voxel objects uh, that's very uh, thin uh, and just dampen the rotation so you're not going to see too much of this rolling. I try to hide it as much as I can. But as long as it's more than one voxel thickness in any direction it's not a problem anymore because then it's going to tumble over and, and stay the way it is. Um, so let's make the other one red. And can I maybe a shape like this. And then we want to see if these uh, collide. And this is where I want to rotate stuff because uh, then you can see say it's something like this. Uh, And normally in collision detection, you have convex objects and you do a search algorithm to find the, toe, the two closest features. And when you have the features, uh, you have an algorithm to clip them uh, to generate contact points uh, according to, and then you reduce the number of contact. It's a pretty complex, uh, <laughs> thing. Collision detection is really hard and on top of that you also have all the floating point precision errors and it's it's a total mess to work with and especially with destruction. If you're going to do procedural destruction with polygon uh, physics uh, that's insanely hard and, and not very fun because it, it just breaks down in so many corner cases that it's that makes it super hard to work with. With voxels on the other hand, almost none of that exists because a voxel objects can have, since there can be voxels anywhere, they can have any shape. There are no restrictions on uh, convexity. There's no search. There's basically no search because when I want to check something, if I want to check if this green voxel here collides with something, uh, I can just transform this position into the uh, see which which voxel does that correspond to in the other object in this one, and in this case it would be this one, right? It's in that grid cell. 
and the only way that can collide with something is if there is voxel data here or since we're not doing a since it can technically mismatch by half a voxel we also have to check these uh, neighboring voxels but as long as not something is not moving too much those are the only uh, places i have to check for collisions there's no searching if you want to see if one voxel collides with something in the other object it's, it's pretty immediate uh, you just go in, uh, in there and look if there's data and if there isn't there's no collision but on top of this uh, doing this for all the voxels would be uh, pretty time consuming because as i said there could be like a million uh, voxels per object and doing like a million by a million that would be I have to wait for hours for that to complete. So, so we have to prune this somehow. And you could do it in a more hierarchical fashion. I'm, I'm not doing that actually. You could use like a, this MIP mapping technique that we did for graphics, but instead it actually ends up not usually being that many voxels you have to check because um, if objects could be like this, it would be a problem. But since they are physical objects and the bounds are pretty tight, it more often looks like this, maybe. It's supposed to stop before they start intersecting, right? So uh, that usually means we don't have a lot of overlap. So the first thing we do is to check a voxel well, the first thing I do is, is actually to, to look for the, the, the bounding box intersection. So I transform, I see, I try to find the bounding box of the intersection. So when checking voxels in this object here, I would probably end up with a bounding box check that is something like this. I don't have to check the other voxels because I know they will not collide with the other one. And when checking for voxels in this one, uh, I'm going to do a similar thing. And in this case, since this one is, is oriented, uh, I would probably end up with something like this, right? So I have to check but it's still a very, typically a very small number of voxels out of the whole object you have to check. And on top of that, there are actually more <coughs> uh, optimizations to be done. So before even coming here as a pre-processing step, when, when something changes a shape or when there is destruction or when loading a level or when something changes, I, I do a pre-processing step, which is pretty quick on each voxel object, where I classify voxels. And in this case, it would mean to see if something is either an edge, a corner, or an inside of an object. And then I, I remember that in a separate voxel representation. So for there's actually one physical representation and one graphical that are both same size and both are voxel data, both have one byte per voxel, but they contain different types of data. So for physics, I store, let's say we give, this is a corner, we can call it C, this is a corner, corner, corner. There is one too. And this one is also considered a corner since it has this convex uh, shape. Uh, this is considered an edge because the only way that could collide is with this one. It always has to, the normal would always point in that direction. So it can be treated a little differently. So is this one. This is also an edge. Edge. And this one is actually an inside 
that doesn't have to be, that don't have to be checked at all. And for uh, this is a pretty small uh, example, but in most large objects, most of the voxels are gonna be like this. If you have thousands, uh, like not thousands, but maybe a uh, hundred by a hundred by fifty voxels, um, and it's more or less solid, it's it's gonna be a lot of those inside voxels, and they're very cheap because they're not processed at all. Um, so classifying the voxels like this, and then we do the same thing on this other one. So it's a corner, corner, corner. All these are corners. There's an edge, 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 and an inside. Uh, an edge can never collide with another edge, so they don't have to be checked. So when I when I check uh, when checking these edge voxels in the green one, I only have to check. Oh, maybe I'm saying this wrong. <laughs> um, let's see. For the corner ones, I have to check for all corner and edge in the other ones. And then I have to do the, the opposite thing. So I take the corners in the other and check for corner and edges in the first one. For edges, I actually don't. Hmm. Maybe maybe I'm I'm remember this incorrectly, and it's also different in three D than in two D. So I actually have <clears throat> one more classification in three D, which is face, and face cannot collide with face. But I have to check edge against the other edges. Um, sorry, this this got a little <laughs> confusing, but you get the idea. <clears throat> I, I would probably write up the details on the blog, but the main idea is that I classify the voxels as a pre-processing step and there are very much fewer checks than you would uh, think. Uh, so typically if you have face voxels like, maybe it's easier to see as an example here. Uh, if we go into this one. And I put this box on the ground here. <clears throat> uh, this box was maybe a bad, let's take this little bigger one. Uh, also not a good example. <clears throat> I'm gonna find an object where this is easier to see. Actually, let's take the container. The container is a good example. It has, uh, assuming the underside here is flat, it has maybe 20 by 60 voxels touching the ground. Uh, so that would be over a thousand contact points if you generated one for every voxel. But since these voxels here are edge voxels, not anymore, <laughs> there are only four corner voxels in this entire container. And that's the four corners. That, that, are, that is close to the ground. Then we have four over here that's just discarded because of the bounding box test. Uh, for doing the collision detection against the ground here, only those four voxels are actually checked for collision against the ground. So there will, there will only be contact points at those four corners. And since these are all face voxels, 
there are no edges, no, no corners, they won't be checked against the container at all. So this classification helps a lot uh, with checking collisions and that's kind of the key to making it run at this speed. And then I think it would probably be possible to, to add some hierarchical uh, thing on top of that, but uh, we'll see <laughs> if maybe I'll experiment with that a little bit. Where it's it gets harder if, if you have something like this. Let me shoot off a little bit here. Um, so I'm trying to keep the same volume. I'm gonna be a little careful and just shoot off. Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> and we look at the shapes here. We can see that this is still almost as many voxels as it was when I started. And so is this one. And now I put them in like an evil configuration like this. Physics do not like this because here we have a lot of overlap, a lot of empty space and a lot of voxels that are both corner and edges and they need to be checked against a lot of other voxels in the other object. So when things look like this, uh, some of those beautiful optimizations don't really do that much. Uh, they really aren't, aren't that useful anymore. But, and that's also why you can see a big pile of rub rubble uh, usually slows things down quite a bit and that's uh, precisely for uh, for that reason questions yes I wrote down a couple that might be related I noticed that performance degrades when large objects are moving or small objects are moving rather quickly do you do anything like shape cast along the trajectory or is this a side effect of something else? I do a shape cast along trajectory and that could be a whole other hour worth of talking <laughs> and trying to sketch things on my iPad, which I'm obviously not very good at, but it's a uh, continuous collision detection is super, super, if regular con collision detection on polygons is hard, doing that continuously is a nightmare. Uh, but in voxel space, there are actually a lot of things you can do that makes that very easy by doing it at, at more discrete steps. Since everything is voxel, we have actually a safe uh, distance uh, we can uh, do this in smaller iterations. And everything is done with continuous collision detection in Teradon. You are sometimes gonna miss collisions anyway, because that's just the way it is. But in most cases, it's actually never going to, just because it has a high speed, doesn't mean it will miss something. If it misses something, it's gonna be because of something else. Typically because the solver uh, didn't manage <clears throat> to fully resolve the collision because there was a lot of weight differences or other things. But yes, okay. there, there is CCD and everything. A clarification here on that question. My question is about physics. Is that someone in Discord has been looking into Performance League where a lot of stuff being sledgehammered down into nothing causes really severe slowdown even if there is no rubble left? But burning it all down doesn't cause the same slowdown. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I, I, I'm very aware of this thing. Uh, I just haven't had the time to uh, demolish an entire level into some tiny pieces to, to profile this. I'm pretty sure I can do something about it. I would assume it's just a lot of debris that's somehow don't get removed or don't get recycled or maybe the shapes get removed and the bodies still live on or I'm not sure but it, I'm pretty sure it's fixable at least. It used to be like this for fires 
and I fixed it for fires, so it should be <laughs> it should be possible to do something similar. That's another one that <clears throat> popped up a few times. I noticed while map making that there's a hard threshold of voxels you can have in a map before performance suddenly drops dramatically, almost halved. You'd assume more voxel equals more lag, but no, the performance drops only happen when I add more voxel to my map past this threshold. Any idea why this happens? <clears throat> I'm not sure what this person means by more voxels. Is that more objects or larger objects? Awaiting clarification. <laughs> because <clears throat> if running on a laptop, for instance, it can sometimes, if you run out of VRAM, it can do that if it goes over to shared memory, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. More objects <laughs> the, yeah, that have that's boxes. the clarification. <laughs> so, uh, in that case, I don't know. I, I still think it can be a memory issue, but it's it's really hard to say. I haven't personally seen that one. I'm curious how large is large, or what is this threshold? So if we have any other questions? So I see, see people talking about the bending of um, pipes and that is, uh, that is just joints and rigid bodies. There is definitely nothing, uh, no soft body physics or something magic to it. It's just seven, eight rigid bodies and joints. And there's the flood fill f question again. <laughs> it's, it's just a, a regular flood fill. There's absolutely nothing special to it uh, within an object. But then the, the hard part about detecting uh, if something breaks and should fall off is, is not within the voxel object itself. It is how it's attached to other voxel objects. As I showed you before, the trunk here and the top part of the tree are two separate shapes. So if I break this in half, uh, this part, this little stump, uh, should stick to the other shape. And that's a whole different level of traversal. Uh, and that's also the reason you can see large buildings hanging in the air, because technically I would have to search through the entire map to make sure uh, that something isn't connected. Uh, so I, I just have a hard limit of, I think, 15 meters maybe in each direction, uh, or is it 10 meters in each direction and 20 upwards and downwards? I can't really remember. Um, and if it's still, uh, didn't contain the chunk that you shot off uh, within that bounding box, uh, then I'm just gonna assume that it is connected somewhere else on the map, which is not always the case if you break something really, really large. We've also passed 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should maybe round off here, uh, unless we have a couple of last questions. Uh... Why don't trees burn? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a pretty good question. I I don't I think I there was a time when fire spread uncontrollably 
uh, now it's a little bit more controlled for performance reasons and if I set fire to grass it was hard to put it out and, and it started fires so often that uh, it was kind of tedious to go and put out all those fires and the, the leaves on the trees and the grass is the same material um, but maybe I should give it another go maybe it's, it's a really good idea some questions about fluid simulation mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, Dennis did some fluid simulation stuff. So, ah, the old Taxido Labs YouTube channel. Yes, that was 10 years ago and it was actually not voxel based, it was a particle simulation. Um, I, I don't think fluid simulation in this world is really realistic considering we're already consuming. Uh, a bit more com computational power than we should. So adding fluid on top of that is probably not a good idea. But uh, some of the <clears throat> the smoke, uh, especially the extinguisher, actually uses fluid simulation or fluid dynamics uh, to compute the motion. So, and that is actually based on the same uh, techniques that were in those ten-year-old videos. So. Some of it is actually in there. All right, should we wrap this up? So thank you very much for watching. I didn't have a lot of time uh, reading the chat. So if you felt like you had a question that didn't get answered, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or uh, or so. And uh, I'll see if I can answer it. I will also put a lot of these. I'm, I'm now writing a series of blog posts on my blog, blog.tuxedolabs.com. Um, so a lot of the stuff I talked about tonight is gonna show up on the blog in one form or another. So uh, keep an eye out for that. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.